Welcome to Mana's Seal YouTube channel. The previous video link is on the description box or on the top right card. Volume 13 The Paladin of the Holy Kingdom. Leah fixed her eyes on a paladin in the distance. You should have realized that when you took the prison camps in this city, you ought to have known that the Sorcerer King was right. You ought to know that you can't do anything else. And you certainly ought to know that it's pointless to obsess over lives you can't save. What you should be doing is devoting all your strength to save the people you can save. Nia fired another arrow. Just like before, her shot killed a girl and the demi-human to which she had been tied. Hurry. Ruro. A shout echoed all around Nia as a stone flew. It seemed to sweep away the anxiety in her heart. The thrown stone hit the demi-humans, who were still hesitating. While it was a long way from being fatal, it would seem that it had done some damage. Hey, you guys. Hurry up and attack the demi-humans. Give up on the kids they're holding hostage. Nia recognized the militiaman who was shouting. He was the father of the boy that the Sorcerer King had killed when they had liberated the first prison camp. Nia was surprised to find him here. If they get past us, the women and children will suffer worse than they did before we save them. If you still love your children, then throw those rocks as hard as you can. His voice seemed to banish all their doubts, and it was shortly followed by a volley of several rocks. While they flew on weird paths and there was no telling where they were aimed at, the fact was that they had been hurled out. By the time Nia drew her bow again, a hail of stones descended on the demi-humans. Many of those stones hit the front-running demi-humans, the ones using children as meat shields. Rather, it would be more accurate to say that they hit the children tied to those demi-humans, than the demi-humans themselves. The children cried and wailed in a heart-rending way. Even so, the rocks smashed mercilessly down on those pitiful children. They were the most tragic sacrifice of all, caught between the savagery of both sides. Nia prioritized aiming for those children. She did that to liberate them from their pain and torment as soon as possible. This was a sign of respect for the few which had to be sacrificed to help the many. Nia leaned out to find her next target, and then she felt something tearing through the air as it approached her, but all she saw was a burst of light. Is this an enemy magic attack? Nia froze for a moment. At the same time, she felt a gentle impact from her belly. It felt like something had struck her lightly there. Startled, she stumbled a step back and then she heard a clattering from her feet. She looked closely and saw something that looked less like a lance than a gigantic arrow in other words, a ballista bolt. Its tip looked like it had been hammered into a right angle by a hammer. Nia hurriedly ducked back behind the wall. After that, she heard a scraping sound as something huge struck the city walls. Cold sweat ran down her back. Nia unconsciously stroked a part of her where she had felt the impact. She thought of how the Sorcerer King had thrown his sword earlier, and it had been deflected by the bubble of light from Busser's armor. That would explain what had taken place just now. It would seem Busser's armor which the Sorcerer King had lent her had protected her. In other words, Nia's life had been saved in the nick of time. Is that some kind of protection from ranged attacks? My chest, shoulders, and belly are protected by the armor, but what about other places? Does that ability have to be activated? No, more importantly, how many more times can I use it? Or has it already been used up? Without the armor that the Sorcerer King had lent her, there was no doubt that Nia would have been impaled through her abdomen. That fact sent shudders through her body. Ha, ha, ha. Come on, come on, damn it. Nia had not entered the radius of under Divine Flag. She had felt that it was unnecessary because she had the circlet which the Sorcerer King had lent her. That was why she could feel the fear of death like this. However, there were no tears in Nia's eyes instead, she gripped her bow before revealing herself. She had resolved herself to continue fighting, even if it meant taking the children's lives. She could not allow herself to lose the will to fight after taking a measly little ballista bolt. This was to keep the children they could not save from suffering any further. At the same time, it was also to slay the demi-humans who had dragged them into battle. The arrow she loosed embodied both these things. The intention to attack without regard for the children spread from her portion of the wall, until everyone was throwing rocks at the demi-humans. Nia even saw the paladins throwing rocks. Bastards. You bastards. Ah, damn it, those demi-humans. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Although those cries of remorse echoed up and down the line, they did not stop throwing their rocks for a moment. This was the attack made by those people who had accepted that some blood had to be shed to save the highest number of lives. However, the enemy was far too numerous. By the time they had struck down the front row the ones who were using children as shields the demi-humans had already reached the vicinity of the walls, and they began deploying their ladders one after the other. While the technologically backward demi-humans could only make battering rams and assault ladders when it came to siege weapons, the truth was that there was no perfect countermeasure against both of those. Several men pushed the ladders away with long sticks, and the angels destroyed several more, but regretfully, there were just too many enemies to face. 
How are the firebombs coming? Get the priests to assist with their spells. This is bad. They've got a ladder up over there. I'll be going over, take care of this side for me. Throw those rocks. There was a big commotion on top of the walls. The defenders were throwing rocks or stabbing with long spears to repel the demi-humans who were clambering up the ladders, but the ladders went up one after the other, and it became difficult to deal with all of them. Several demi-humans nimbly avoided the spear thrusts from the militiamen, instead grasping the spears and pulling their wielders off the wall. Then there were those demi-humans like the armets and the bladers, whose natural defensive strength was comparable to full plate armor. They ignored the spears and rushed all the way up. While the paladins had been trained in combat and could deal with these heavily protected demi-humans, the number of demi-humans on top of the walls grew and grew. Any gaps which appeared were immediately filled up. After stiffening her resolve, Nia leaned out from behind a battlement and shot a climbing demi-human from the side. It was not Nia's skill so much as the weapon she wielded which killed the demi-humans in one shot. She could slay the resilient armets and bladers because she possessed the ultimate shooting star super. Nia's body was clearly visible as she leaned out, and she was hit several times by stones spat by stone eaters. Although those stones could put dents in metal plates, Nia was protected by Busser's armor. Still, she would probably be bruised, and she might have suffered a fracture or two. Though she was sweating heavily, she did not stop firing on the demi-humans for a moment. I can still do this. I only have enough mana to use the necklace of healing which his majesty lent me once, so I need to save it. As she continued landing shot after accurate shot, part of her mind tried to estimate how long she could hold out. After all, Nia's single use of recovery magic was her trump card. She pulled an arrow from her quiver, knocked it to her bow, took aim at a demi-human's head or heart, and then loosed it. She repeated that sequence countless times. A rock hit her heart enough to knock the arrow from her hand. Nia hurriedly ducked behind a battlement. She had dropped her arrow because the stone eater's attack had made Nia's entire body groan in pain, but that was not the only reason. Paladins were sword users. As a squire, she had trained with swords, so even if she knew the fundamentals of archery, she had not spent much time practicing with bows. This lack of practice made her arms cramp up and her fingers ache. If she could not use a bow, then she would only be getting in the way. It was far too soon for her to use her trump card now, but she had no other way to restore her ability to fight. Activate. Heavy recover. The mana drained from Nia's body, and it made her feel a little dizzy. She would not be able to do this a second time. At the same time, all the pain in her body vanished, be it the cramps in her arms or her aching fingers. I can do this. Neil leaned out again and continued shooting. Fortunately, Jeldabiat's forces possessed some degree of leadership. Otherwise, the Ballasty would have fired on Nia to kill her without hesitation, but since they were being led, they did not shoot for fear of hitting their friendlies. Nia continued shooting as if she were in a dream. Eventually the hand that reached down to her quiver came up empty. She looked down in panic and saw that she was out of arrows. Just then, a scream came from the militiamen. There was a very strong-looking demi-human standing in front of a ladder. While it was no different from the stone eaters who had fired rocks at Nia, its physique was excellent. Though it was no match for Busser, it still radiated the aura of a powerful being. It held a crude-looking greatsword in its right hand, which resembled a meat cleaver. The other held a helmet that seemed to contain something. It was the head of the paladin which commanded this area. The great Jage and Sama of the Lagan tribe has taken the head of the enemy commander. Now, you dogs, kill them. Kill all the humans. The situation immediately turned grim. Paladins were few in number, and a death from among those small numbers meant that the defensive strength of this area would plummet. And then, there was one more thing. There was a tremendous disparity in fighting strength between a militiaman and a paladin, even if the latter were not part of a hand-picked elite. There was no way the militiaman could win against a demi-human that could kill one of those paladins. As the militiamen froze in fear, the demi-humans scaled the ladder behind the stone eater from just now Jajin. They burst forth like water from a broken dam, one becoming two, and two becoming four. It was like mitosis. Demi-humans began to fill the top of the wall, and in turn, the number of militiamen began to diminish. Demi-humans and militiamen. The difference in their individual abilities was plain to see. She looked around in panic. Arrows. She could not do anything without arrows. She cast her eyes around like a traveler in a desert searching for an oasis, and then she saw a thoroughly exhausted soldier leaning against a battlement. There was a quiver with arrows beside him. That's it. I'll take the arrows from that wounded man and send him back to the rear. But Nia sucked in a breath as she ran over. The man who looked like an archer was missing half his face. He was clearly dead. He had probably taken a direct hit from a stone eater. His brains were oozing out, his glassy eyes stared out into nothing, and his fate might very soon be Nia's as well. She looked more closely, and found several similar corpses. Her usually sensitive nose finally picked up the thick scent of gore in the air. No, her nose was fine, her brain simply had not received the input from it.
As the porridge suddenly rose in her throat, Nia forced herself to swallow it back down with all her might. She barely succeeded, but there was no telling if it was because she had been lucky, or because she had become resistant to this after watching the live eating performance earlier. Nia grit her teeth and transferred the arrows remaining in the nameless archer's quiver to her own. Restocking her quiver felt like she was restoring her own fighting spirit. I can still fight. There are still things I can do. After quickly finishing up her work, Nia put the corpse's hands together and closed his remaining eye. There was no time to spare on doing that, but she could not stop herself from doing it. I'll fight for your sake too. Until the very end. As Nia turned and rose, she no longer muttered to herself. Her spirit rose to a peak it had never reached before, and her senses were incredibly keen. She felt like she was a part of the bow which she held. The top of the wall was now a chaotic melee. Considering Nia's skills, it seemed almost impossible to snipe Jajin, who was holding up the head of the paladin, given the sheer numbers of friends and foes between them. However, I still have these gauntlets. And the ultimate shooting star super his majesty lent me. I can do this. She loosed her arrow as she filled herself with that powerful conviction. By the time Jajin noticed the whistling in the air, it was too late. The arrow pierced his head, and Jajin fell limply to the ground. Jajin of the Lagan tribe has fallen by the hand of Nia Although she shouted those words, she was not answered by a cheer. That was only to be expected. There was no time for a long hurrah in the middle of a life and death battle. Nia felt a little embarrassed as she realized that, but she had succeeded in shaking the demi-human's morale. She could feel the pressure on them easing off. It would seem this had not been a complete defeat. Nia took up her arrow again, then turned to face a suitable demi-human before sending an arrow his way. She shot the demi-human through the head and he fell from the wall.